Chimir is a distant planet. It is defined by waves of life brought from Earth and set free to evolve independently in this new context. The indigenous life of the planet, swarms of microbes called magic by the people who live there, are what harvest Earth organisms and make copies on Chimir. As the asteroid which concluded the Mesozoic never struck Chimir, dinosaurs remain the dominant terrestrial megafauna. Trilobites were a clade of arthropods in Earth's history. They had armored carapaces with three lobes, hence the name, and were benthic feeders which crawled along the sea floor. They were one of the iconic members of the Cambrian Explosion, an eruption of adaptive radiations from very basal animals into many of the lineages which dominate today, and trilobites remained highly successful throughout much of the Paleozoic. Their life cycle began in larval stages, eventually molting into a miniature of their adult morph, then gaining segments and size as they continue to molt with age. Their decline occurred during the Devonian, at the end of which almost all trilobite clades died out in an extinction event driven by nutrient runoffs and algal blooms prompted by the early rise of land plants. Only one trilobite lineage, the Protids, would survive the conclusion of the Devonian, and they would never recover their numbers and diversity on Earth. Just as their fate was sealed on our planet, a new creature arrived on Earth. A swarm of unicellular organisms. They came not from our land or sea, but from the sky. They were the first arrival of life indigenous to another planet. Earth's first visitor from the stars. It was a cloud of organisms sent from Chimir. A cloud of magic. The magic was a satellite to the Great Portal, one of Chimir's elder gods. As the satellite traveled around our world, it consumed many things, pulling them apart atom by atom in an effort to understand our composition. Once it understood how our complex multicellular bodies are made, it sent that data back to its home planet dozens of light years away. Using elements from its surroundings, the god used the data sent by its satellite as a blueprint to create copies of Terran life. Much of the god's focus was on plants, which are much more efficient to generate the energy it needed than the native unicellular organisms. However, it also replicated many animals from this first harvest. Among these first animals introduced to Chimere were the trilobites. Unfortunately, Although Chimir and Earth were quite similar, the atmosphere was not yet a perfect match. There was a plankton base in the ocean and oxygen in sea and air, but larger creatures struggled to survive. The process of terraforming would take some time, and for a while, only the portal's territory was hospitable. Larger trilobites were among those who perished, though some of the smaller species survived, and were instrumental in creating this new world to be hospitable for Terran life. Several other harvests from Earth occurred, and with each new introduction of Earth life, the climate would become more comfortable to life from our planet. It is estimated that it took around a million years for the god's territory to become stable, and another few million before the planet was truly inhabitable for all Earth life, but once that milestone was achieved, their terraformed planet would forever be a mirror of our own. Trilobites, Placoderm fish, Eurytorids, Brachiopods, Goniotites, and Chondorichthian fish had their own adaptive radiations, and their populations and species diversity rippled across a planet nearly twice as large as our own. Many of these were of lineages endangered or by that time extinct on Earth. As none of the native organisms were multicellular, while magic and plankton competed for space, organisms larger than a centimeter were entirely without competition. Plants and indigenous plankton supported a marine ecosystem of unprecedented productivity. Trilobites reached populations and species diversity far exceeding their Cambrian heights. There were four clades of trilobites introduced to Chimera in these first harvests, and they had varying degrees of success. Most abundant and diverse were the Phacopids. 
Their highly sophisticated eyes of this lineage allow them to better detect predators than other orders, which appears to have served them well. Within a million years after harvest, several genera had erupted into a diversity of species with global distribution. Some had complex head ornamentation that they would use to combat rivals or displace other trilobites from prime feeding sites. It didn't take long for this order to comprise almost 80% of all Chimeran trilobites, and they were a vast majority of those in shallow coastal waters. The next most abundant clade were the Lycids. While all four lineages could roll up, the Lycids were masters of the craft, being fully sealed once rolled in. This made for impressive predator defenses. Many had an impressive array of spikes along their carapace, further deterring predation. The other two clades had success in Chimer, but within the shadow of their more aggressive and defensive kin. Harpids were characterized by a wide and very long head, often extending past the entire length of the trilobite. This helped them sift through the sediment, especially in being easily elevated so the legs could supplement. There were some shallow water species, although they tended to be more abundant and successful in deeper waters, perhaps to avoid competition. Like all trilobites, however, harpids had to return to shallow waters to reproduce. Last and least abundant were the protids. These filled in whatever niches and gaps were left by other clades. They were generally very small. In order to avoid competition, they became increasingly invested in burrows. Their offspring were fewer in number, but more developed at hatching, further helping to avoid competition with their more abundant kin. Their greatest abundance was along leeward coasts near mountain ranges, perhaps because there wasn't much in the way of nutrients in these sediments to attract the more dominant clades. Even as the least successful clade, protids still estimated to have numbered in the billions, especially in these near-desert coasts. They often nested upriver to avoid coastal predators, especially since these arid regions had very little freshwater and terrestrial life. Though many animal clades had tremendous success in the earliest years of Chimere's terraforming, trilobites as a whole were among its greatest success stories. Unfortunately, this golden age was not to last. The gardens of terrestrial plants, grown and maintained by the Elder God, quickly grew beyond its territory. This was of little concern to the God, who only cared about the range of its own influence. A formidable jungle crawled and clawed across the continents, including the polar regions due to the high global temperatures, preventing the formation of ice caps. On Earth, the spread of plants had devastating consequences, leading to Earth's first mass extinction. The same process was taking place in Chimere. Although tectonic activity was not at the same rate, so the consequences of the spread of plants was a more isolated factor, these plants were larger and more derived than the first plants of Earth, and the nutrients released by the spread in the establishment of the first soils was therefore much more rapid and a devastating process. This was a time of abundance on the land, but not only did it release the phosphorus and ground nitrogen mean that algae could erupt in population, phosphorus is a limiting agent in another lineage. The indigenous purple algae, which is a plankton base, Magic and plant plankton can share space and absorb different light, although they are other limiting agents that separate Earth and Chimeran plankton. Phosphorus is a shared population limit between the two. As phosphorus spiked from the runoffs, both magic and phytoplankton populations ruptured with abandon. The coastal shallows became a dense soup. Eventually all plankton below the surface died from another limiting agent, sunlight. The rot poisoned the waters and oxygen was depleted. As the terrestrial ecosystems persisted with increasing success, the oceans were dying. Most lineages were severely decreased, if not outright extinguished. The ornamented phacopids and defensive lycids both went extinct very quickly. They may have been dominant clades, but they were largely restricted to coastal shallows, which went from Chimera's most productive habitat to a toxic sludge. 
Not only could they not breathe in the sludge, they couldn't reproduce. Being more aggressive didn't matter when none of the Phacopids' specialized habitats survived, and being able to better fend off predators it didn't save the lichens from the algae. Most harpids also perished, but a few species in the arid coasts were able to reproduce amidst the terraforming since these regions weren't as densely poisoned due to the lack of runoff, and much less overwhelming since it was just spring-fed rivers. As scavengers and detritivores, harpids were instrumental in cleaning up the blooms, especially in these arid coasts. The natural cycles of ocean currents brought more and more algae to these coasts, but it was reduced enough that harpids, brachiopods, and gonitites were able to maintain these habitats. The protein trilobites also survived, thanks to reproducing upriver from the sludge, especially in the estuaries of rivers not clogged by algae due to the relative absence of vegetation in these leeward rivers. By being forced to live on the fringes and helping them endure hard times, these survivors inherited the world, but they would not do so alone. Eventually, the algo bloom subsided thanks to the fact that all of the nutrients released by the terraforming of the land decreased in rate. All that rot eventually was processed and recycled. A lot of it settled down in the depths, with these nutrients perhaps drawing the first Terran life down into the abyss. Before the trilobites and other marine fauna from their refuges could return to the known world and other rich shallows, the portal enacted several harvests from Earth's Carboniferous. Life on Chimere's land was stable and thriving, so these harvests almost exclusively targeted marine fauna, though a few terrestrial Carboniferous organisms like Arthropulera wound up being collected. Trilobites may have suffered in Earth through the Carboniferous, but they erupted with success during the First Dynasty. Some new proteids were introduced from Earth, but these two native clades had the most success, especially beyond the known world. During this time, proteids derived into numerous different clades of their own, with mimics of the defense and aggressive Devonian relatives, freshwater, and even terrestrial taxa. The Harpids didn't derive too much, though the deep-sea lineage that completely abandoned the coastal waters and reproduced in the depths became their most novel members. Although Trilobites seem to have had a reputation for not being particularly competitive lineage, it's important to remember that their decline and extinction on Earth was largely driven by extreme and unprecedented conditions. The last trilobites of Earths appear to have perished in the Great Dying, while being weakened by low sea levels depriving them of favored reproductive and feeding habitats. In Chimere, the combination of features which led to their decline and extinction on Earth didn't strike to the same degree as other factors didn't enhance these catastrophes. The protids absolutely thrived during the First Dynasty, with freshwater and terrestrial clades reaching their prime in swamp and rainforest, and coastal taxa enjoying an abundance of habitat thanks to high sea levels. The general arid and cooling trend toward the end of the First Dynasty both cleared the jungles and lowered the sea levels in corresponding shallow seas. A vast majority of trilobite lineages perished in these years, with the Permian Dynasty being a period of very low trilobite diversity. The protids died at the end of Earth's Permian, no such catastrophe concluded the Permian Dynasty, and the few surviving trilobites got to enjoy a land of plenty as the climate warmed and went into the hot and humid Mesozoic Dynasties. As Chimerian oceans increased in complexity, especially during these Mesozoic Dynasties, many trilobite species went on to diversify into broad clades. Many of the lineages from this adaptive radiation, including long-bodied herbivores and horned brawlers, would reach heights during the time, and persist to modern times, becoming increasingly complex and competitive. While there are other known beyond the known world, within the known world today, there are seven clades of trilobite, six protids, and one harpid. First, and best understood, are the meadow or common trilobites. 
They have taken after the lichens in being impenetrable when they roll up, thanks to a high number of extremely hard segments. Most have spikes to deter predators, swallowing them whole once they are rolled up. The common, or meadow trilobite, is among the most abundant macro arthropods in the inland sea, outnumbered only by the blue crab. They are generalist detritivores, scavenging corpses, consuming dead seagrass, and anything left to rot. Though this gives them a reputation for being unclean by some, Kaleen view them as a delicacy. Feathered or reef trilobites are so named for their long display structures made up by the last of their pleural spines. These reef dwellers have extremely dexterous mouth parts and are primarily herbivores, feeding on algae and floral detritus in the reefs and being important in keeping them clean and healthy. They are often quite colorful. Mole trilobites are, as their name suggests, burrowing specialists. The largest species is only 5 inches or 12 centimeters long, and most are much smaller. They are the most abundant by a substantial margin, though the larger species of meadow trilobites earned them the title of common. Their burrowing usually aren't that complex, but reef clades that bore into corals do so with much more complex homes than those who simply dig into the sand or base of seagrass. Deer trilobites take after the unrelated phacopids, with elaborate cranial ornamentation that they use to compete with one another. Though females have fairly uniform hornlets regardless of taxa, the massive many-pronged horns, which form a unique shape to the males of each species, is a notable example of sexual dimorphism among trilobites. The larger species tend to have larger and more ornate headgear, with the best example being the moose head. They engage in impressive jousting matches, often with an effort to flip the loser. Given their headgear and generally being quite front-heavy, righting themselves can take a few minutes, meaning the winner has plenty of time to corral and move away their mates. Females have small horns, which are still fully capable of flipping other arthropods that compete with them, a signal that while the main driving force of these features is sexual selection, there is an intraspecific use for them as well. The largest trilobite known to the assembly is the Shear Flank. These 3 to 4 meter trilobites are the only species of their clade in the known world. They are herbivores specializing in seagrass, which is a key to their success and size in this habitat. The great length means that they are incapable of rolling up in self-defense, but the orientation of their pleural spines is such that the blades self-sharpen as the animal turns, so a quick lateral curl can deliver a devastating wound that makes most predators avoid them. Like all arthropods, they are quite vulnerable after a molt. Large adults will typically bury themselves during this time of vulnerability, but young must take advantage of this period of a soft exoskeleton to grow, so must consume an unprecedented amount of grass, which means that the vast majority of their mortality occurs during this time. Even so, the abundance of ideal habitat means that shear flank are still fairly abundant. Shear flank are among the longest-lived trilobites, most species reach adult morphs after a year, adult size in two or three, and perish after eight to ten years. Shear flank continue to grow and add both segments and segment size as they age, which can make them enormous, though the rate of growth does slow. The largest recorded was nearly five meters long and estimated to be almost a century old. Many trilobite lineages have independently shrugged off their ties to the sea, even though salt water is an important component of mineralizing their shells. The river trilobites spend a vast majority of their lives in river systems of the known world. Some do return to estuaries to molt and reproduce, though a few softshell clades don't visit the saline waters at all. They are generally extremely small, less than an inch long, 
although a few, like the Picardian Pebbleback of the Picardian Highlands, are the size of a person's hand. All trilobites can spend some time out of the water, though for most it's only about a half hour or so until their lungs dry out. River trilobites can trap moisture near their lungs so they can be out of water for several days. They aren't as free of water as the unrelated terrestrial trilobites from back in the first dynasty, but they can cover a lot of distance in a few days, often wandering several miles between river systems looking for new territory. The shells of freshwater trilobites are not as soft as their name might suggest, but they are not nearly as defensive as their marine cousins. Though coastal harpids have been found beyond the known world, it seems their greatest success has been in the abyss. Though they are not well understood, they are still quite common sight in the few deep-sea investigations made by the assembly, notably at least one giant species which appears to use their great size to efficiently travel between whale falls. The species most commonly encountered in the known world is the hoofhead trilobite. This species is extremely abundant in the Kaleen Sea, preferring these cooler and slightly deeper waters than the inland sea. They are detritivores, far outnumbering the horseshoe crabs, which occupy a similar niche. Hoofhead trilobites are a staple in the diets of many Kaleen, especially considering the greater amount of quality meat in their head compared to the protid lineages. Some have suggested this may be a harpid, which come from the abyssal sanctuaries, but it may be an undiscovered lineage of coastal residents. The same species is also found in the coastal waters of Kaishel, though it is believed that this may be due to their larvae being carried between the two great currents cycling the known world in Kaishel, rather than coming up from the abyss. There are reports of a yet unstudied species of trilobite in Whalehaven Gulf, which some think may be a relic lichid, diagnosed by the tight rolling and spikes described by the specimen, which unfortunately did not get preserved. Both of these traits have been seen in derived protids, so this may be a case of misidentification. Trilobites have developed a reputation for being uncompetitive and doomed to an inevitable extinction. This could not be further from the truth. Not only did they survive and thrive on Earth for almost 200 million years, with several lineages recovering and persisting for another 100 million, their decline was driven by external factors such as algal blooms and dropping sea levels laying ruin to their breeding sites. Though many of the same events struck trilobites and chimere, the order of events happened to spare a few lineages, and those who survived have thrived. Thank you so much to the Siren Lord for sponsoring this episode. As someone with a lot of knowledge concerning trilobites and their evolution, having their advice was invaluable. My sponsor has also published a novel of his own, a fantasy story called Saga of Myria. Follow the link above if you'd like to check it out. Thank you so much to my Patreon patrons for your continued support. I couldn't do all this without you, and I really appreciate the support you give. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next week when we explore a sequel to the Sloth episode. Cheers, folks!